I need a volunteer, someone who can wear a jacket and just walk up and down and then take the jacket off. Anybody? Any volunteer? Okay. Okay. Now, I'm just going to put this on you. Uh, the, the other way, the other way. This way. No, no, this way. This oh, way. this, this way. way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> Okay, if you can just walk up to the door and come back for me, please. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. <laughs> Uh, uh, can you can you easy. can you tell them how you felt with that one? It was kind of heavy. I'm out of breath already. Okay. Just walking, what is it? Three yards, three yards. Okay. And um, I felt my heart, you know, a little heavy. Okay. Good enough. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if if any of us would like to lose about ten pounds of body weight and know how it feels, this jacket is 10 pounds. It's only 10 pounds. I weighed it uh, just a few days ago. All right, my name is Usman Sharif. I'm an interventional uh, cardiologist. Uh, my, my background is interventional cardiology. What I do is balloon stents. Uh, I open up blockages in the heart, legs, kidneys, wherever blood goes, I go. Uh, so sometimes I call myself uh, a plumber, if you may. Yeah? Just to kind of uh, take you into my world, uh, give me two minutes. We'll digress away from the topic today. This is what I do for a living. Can you all see, uh, can you all see the slide? Okay, bear with me while I explain this to you, okay? I know this is looking like just a tree or some branches hung in space, uh, but that's not what this is. This was a young man <coughs> who came to me with a massive heart attack. I mean, he was just in agonizing chest pain. He described to me, Doc, I feel like an elephant sitting on my chest. Uh, do something. He was just screaming and crying in pain in the emergency room. So we, uh, he was having a massive uh, anterior wall myocardial infarction, fancy name for a heart attack on the front portion of the heart. So when we took him to the cat lab, uh, and when I went up the groin and took pictures of his heart, this is what I found. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. You see this big uh, branch here? This is the dye injection that we give, and there's supposed to be three branches, one here, one down here, and another one down here which is missing. What you see in here is a wire that I was able to thread down into the branch that is missing. And this is the stump of the branch that is missing. So we're able to uh, thread this down. This little uh, bump here is the uh, balloon. Uh, and the stent, we were able to balloon it, stent it. Uh, bear with me. And this is how it looks now. Blood was going down all the way. Uh, it looks like how it did uh, when he was born, if you may. Uh, his pain completely went away. Uh, he had no symptoms whatsoever, and he left the cat lab smiling. Uh, actually, the next morning, he was walking up uh, on the floor uh, and flirting with some of the nurses and remarked to me, Doc, I want to go home. This uh, is a 70-something-year-old uh, gentleman who came to my office uh, complaining to me that, Doc, Every time I walk, my left leg hurts, it feels heavy, and I can't walk, I just can't live like this. Uh, my quality of life has just gone downhill uh, and do something. Uh, I can't do anything in my life. So what, uh, what he had was blockages in his legs. Uh, how, do, how do we know that? I mean, sometimes just a simple exam, all we have to do is put our uh, hands on the feet, and we know that there is not enough blood going down into the uh, feet. And blockages is almost always the reason why uh, this happens. So what we did on him, and this is his leg. This is the knee joint. 
This is the left leg, this is the knee joint, and there is a nice big blood vessel that goes down from the groin all the way down to the feet. Are you all with me on this one? Yeah. Okay, can you point out to me where the blockages are? Do you all see it from back there? So as you can imagine, that even to an untrained eye, it's pretty obvious how, where the blockages are in this man. No? So there's one big blockage here, and this one here, and this one here. This one here particularly bothered me, because this is like somebody took a piece of stone. I mean, if you look at this blockage down here and look at the bone, they're of the same density. You see that? See, this is the bone here, and this is the blockage. So this, these two are of the same density, which tells me that this is basically calcium. And that happens as the blockages age, uh, and if you have these for a number of years, they undergo hardening and they undergo calcification and become like, uh, like bone, if you may, uh, which makes our life uh, much harder, and we have to pull out uh, all the tools we have. We have rotor rotors and lasers and what have you to go through these blockages. So what I did on him uh, was we went through this blockage, we used uh, a laser on this one to kind of create a channel, and then I had to use a rotor rotor. It's, l it's literally a rotor rotor. That's all it is. Uh, just a miniaturized rotor rotor which the plumber in our homes <laughs> uses. Uh, and we, we were able to open up this blockage. This blockage doesn't, didn't look as bad as this one. And this one as well, we were able to open it up uh, with a laser device. Huh? This is how it looks now. Of course, I'm not going to succeed in making it look like how it did when he was born. Uh, but given what we had, uh, this was a tremendous uh, amount of improvement. And he was able to walk, he, uh, to do whatever he wants to. And he, he, uh, he never complained of uh, pain in his legs again. And these are the different devices we use. This is a laser which literally uh, pulverizes the, uh, the, block, the uh, plaque buildup, if you may, or dissolves the plaque buildup. It's the same laser which is used for liposuction. We use it in different devices inside the blood vessels. This is how the rotor rotor looks. Uh, it has diamond tip chips. It rotates at about 160 to 180,000 RPMs. And it travels over a small, teeny tiny wire, which is uh, 0 0.14 inch in diameter. So it's kind of like a travels over a wire, which is a little thicker than my hair. Huh? This is how a stent looks. And this is a balloon. And this is uh, a sanding device. Uh, this is actually like a shaver, if you may. This disc here uh, rotates. And then it, uh, we, we move this whole device up and down as we uh, shape the blockage. And then the debris kind of gets collected into here. This is a fox hollow uh, kind of device. This is a device where it has many holes. We create a venturi effect and kind of we suck the uh, blood clots and the blockage into this tube and out it comes through the body. Yeah? So we have a zillion uh, ways to get rid of blockages. Uh, this is actually a piece of uh, uh, the blockage that I was able to uh, uh, get out using the shaving device and the uh, suction device, if you may. And we put it in a test tube, and I took a picture of this uh, to show it in a slide presentation here. This is how it looks, kind of like a pizza topping. <laughs> so I did this for a number of years. I mean, I've been doing this, uh, actually, I would like to correct. I've been here for 12 years, not five, but thank you for making me seven years younger. Uh, I've been doing this for the last 25 years of my life. Uh, after doing thousands and thousands uh, of blockages in the heart and the legs and the kidneys and in the neck or, or what have you, uh, it, you know, over a period of time, it kind of begins to, uh, you wonder, geez, is there anything we can do to prevent these blockages from happening? What can we do? What are we doing to ourselves? Why wasn't this a problem, uh, such a big problem 60 years ago? What have we done to ourselves? At an individual level, what have we done to ourselves at a societal level, uh, which is making these blockages as bad uh, as they are now? Huh? So all you need to do is kind of look at the, uh, go around the world, uh, go to France, go to Japan, uh, look at what they do, uh, look at their uh, lifestyle, uh, and see uh, how the incidence of coronary artery disease in those countries is. It turns out uh, that if you, uh, and you can Google, you can go home and Google this information. Uh, it turns out 
uh, that the incidence of blockages uh, or coronary artery disease or heart disease is the highest in Ukraine. They eat a ton of red meat, they don't exercise as much, uh, and it tends to be the lowest in France and Japan. How many have you, of you have traveled to France and Japan? Raise your hands. Okay. Every time I go to France and Japan, I've been to both, uh, both places, I'm amazed, uh, just sitting in the shopping mall and looking around, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how uh, skinny uh, most men and women are. Uh, and if you go to a restaurant, it's like, what's wrong with you guys? Where's the food? The food is hidden on the, uh, on the plate. It's in one corner uh, of the plate. Uh, and you travel to Tokyo, uh, all you see is fish. Uh, and it turns out uh, that studies have been done uh, in, uh, in Japan uh, mm -hmm. and in France to see uh, what it is, uh, what is the reason why we have so many blockages in our country and wh why, why is it that blockages in Japan and uh, France are so low. This is called the Japanese paradox, if you may. Uh, it turns out that the, uh, the, the men in Japan, for example, have the same incidence of smoking, same incidence of diabetes uh, as uh, the men in US do. But nevertheless, the incidence of blockages uh, in Japan, of incidence of heart disease uh, in Japan, happens to be among the lowest in the entire world. So why is this so? What are they doing to themselves? So one thing that we noticed uh, as, epidemi as epidemiologists is uh, the, uh, the consumption of fish in Japan is extremely high. I mean, they eat fish once or twice. Well, I didn't see them for breakfast, but lunch and dinner, every restaurant you go to, everywhere you go, you see people eating fish. So what is it in fish that helps us? So is, is, is diet so important? You bet it is. And the rest of the her discussion here will be uh, focused on diet and not plumbing. Huh? So what are the good guys? Uh, I mean, I'll just briefly go over uh, what kind of uh, food, uh, what kind of chemicals, what kind of uh, uh, you know, vitamins and antioxidants and what kind of vegetables are good for us. I mean, normally when you go to a diet lecture, you hear, don't eat this, don't eat that. And if it tastes good, spit it out. And that's not what we are uh, trying to achieve down here. I'll try and impress upon you uh, what science has to tell us. I mean, is vitamin E good for you, vitamin A good for you, vitamin C? Uh, and what does the literature say? What does science say? I mean, I, if you walk into a GNC store, you'll have someone with a high school education trying to sell you all kinds of supplements. And supplement industry is $500 million a year. So they're selling us hope. But what's the, uh, the scientific evidence behind this? It turns out that fish has what we call as omega-3 fatty acids. These are the good fat. They're also seen, it's also present in walnuts and spinach, for example, but most of it comes from fish, especially salmon. Legumes and nuts, uh, legumes uh, like lentils, uh, peas, or, or beans, all kinds of beans, kidney beans, pinto beans, feva beans, edamame, uh, you name it, and all kinds of beans are in the legume family. Uh, the nuts, veggies and fruits, uh, grapes. Uh, I know a lot of you uh, like to drink a glass of wine every night. Uh, and for those of you who don't want to do something on those lines, you can drink grape juice. It has two chemicals, which is called as resveratrol and flavonoids. And guess what? Those are the chemicals found in wine. They're also found in grape juice, and it's good enough for you. We eat the whole grape, not just the grape juice, uh, because that way you're getting in a little more fiber as well. Huh? Can you all hear me? Is my voice echoing? Am I too close to the mic? OK, good. Um, so these are the two chemicals that are found uh, in grape juice and wine, which are known uh, to decrease, A, the inflammation of blood vessels. And all of this has been proven with tens of thousands of patients in clinical trials. Huh? <coughs> garlic, I know we all hear about garlic, uh, but, no, but very few of us uh, dare uh, to consume garlic because we don't want to stink all day. Uh, but it turns out uh, that the odorless garlic is not as useful. Why? Because the chemical in garlic that makes it, uh, that brings out that pungent odor is the chemical that also prevents heart disease. And that chemical is known as allicin. So how much garlic should we take? One clove of fresh garlic a day is good enough. 
Obviously, you can't just chew, take a clove of garlic and chew. Uh, you'll be smelling like garlic all day and maybe for the next few days, uh, but put it in your food. Uh, that's kind of what uh, is uh, recommended. And if you don't want to do that, try and buy garlic that's not odorless. If it says odorless on the bottle, then please remember the chemical that is also good, brings out the odor, which gives rise to the odor, is the one that is uh, good for heart disease. Dark chocolate, uh, I kind of hesitate to recommend this because when you uh, eat dark chocolate, uh, what else do we do? Uh, there's a ton of calories that come along with that. Okay, so if, but if you have to pick chocolate, you're better off picking dark chocolate than milk chocolate. Why? Because uh, cocoa powder uh, has the same uh, benefits of uh, dark chocolate. I mean, you can uh, do, uh, you can use cocoa powder in, uh, you know, in your shake uh, and drink every single day. It has flavonoids. And these are known to promote vasodilatation, decreased inflammation, decreased LDL, decreased plaque buildup, and decreased heart disease, uh, to make a long story short. Uh, green tea, I know we uh, hear about green tea a lot. Uh, so I looked up the literature. I did a scientific review on green tea. Uh, it turns out that if you drink more, more than four or five glasses of green tea a day, it can give rise to kidney stones. It can give rise to side effects. So you don't want to drink more than, more than four or five, but yes, a few of them. The literature is kind of wishy-washy. It may be helpful, may definitely not harmful, but it is leaning towards maybe helpful towards heart disease. And in the interest of time, because I have a ton of topics to cover, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all the clinical trials and just give you the conclusions on these clinical trials. Huh? Spices. Uh, if you travel uh, to the east, uh, you'll see a ton of spices in almost every single dish. And to name a few, ginger, black pepper, cinnamon, coriander. Cinnamon, you'll see some diabetologists who use cinnamon uh, to uh, make you less uh, insulin uh, resistant. So yes, uh, spices uh, do help uh, a lot. What's unproven, and I have a lot of my patients who ask me these questions, uh, Doc, I take CoQ10, I take vitamin A, C, E, beta carotene, uh, will they help me prevent heart disease? Uh, I'm sorry to say because the, 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 the literature does not support uh, uh, the beneficial effects of any of these uh, industry of any of these chemicals on heart disease as of now. In fact, uh, beta carotene, I mean I don't want to discourage you, but beta carotene is known uh, to be associated with a higher incidence of guess what, lung cancer. I don't know where that came from, uh, but the association has been made in a number of studies. Uh, vitamin A, C, uh, lutein, lycopene, selenium, uh, CoQ10, uh, they have not been uh, proven uh, to decrease uh, the incidence of heart disease. Like I mentioned, the supplement industry likes to sell us hope. Uh, it's a lot of hype, uh, and it is about $500 million a year. I can promise you, just walk down to GNC, walk down to any of the health stores. I have nothing against any of them, uh, but you'll have these uh, high school students at the counter trying to sell you all kinds of vitamins. All right, so coming to diet, the rest of my uh, lecture will be kind of focused on diet, uh, and I think we'll be doing disservice to ourselves uh, if we don't uh, address the problem of obesity. Uh, so I'll address the problem of obesity, uh, what we can do about it, because obesity is lack of dieting, if you may, lack of dieting and exercise. So we'll kind of touch upon those few topics, and if I'm going beyond 6, uh, what, what time did we start? 6.30. So if I go beyond 7.15, just wave your hand so I kind of know when to slow down and when to speed up. All right? Okay. Uh, so diet, <coughs> diet composition, uh, when I show you uh, my lectures uh, on the obesity, on my slides on the obesity in the next few minutes, I'll be covering what food is made up of. Uh, just like uh, how you have uh, you know, the framing and the plumbing and the electrical systems in the home, you have some building blocks uh, in the food that we eat. What do we call these building blocks? Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So how much of each do we take? Uh, how, uh, and, and how do we count? And, and, and you hear words like calories being thrown in. What is a calorie? I mean, those are the kind of basic concepts which I'm trying to impress upon uh, you this evening. So bear with me, and if you don't understand, raise your hand. I'll be happy to stop and go back. Uh, remember these uh, numbers uh, uh, somewhere in the uh, back of your mind? Uh, the American Heart Association recommends uh, that we take less than 30% of calories from fat. And if you don't remember, don't worry about it. We'll cover this again in a little bit. 
the lion diet heart study, uh, this was, uh, I included the lion diet heart study and the physician's health study. These were the two landmark uh, trials where, you know, for example, the physician's health study had over 30,000 people and they followed them for 12 years. Uh, so if somebody makes a claim saying, uh, you know, chemical A is good for you, chemical B is good for you, ask for evidence. I mean, we practice evidence-based medicine. Uh, it's not uh, based on uh, anything else but evidence. So where does evidence come? Uh, uh, where does evidence come from? It comes from clinical trials, and clinical trials have to be tens of thousands of patients followed for some years, sometimes uh, decades. So the physician's health study and the lion diet heart study are the two of the most famous uh, studies which are quoted uh, in terms of diet and heart disease. The lion diet has to be looked at the uh, Mediterranean style, low in red meat and dairy, but high in olive oil, fish, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. It turns out that the incidence of MI or myocardial infarction or heart attacks and sudden cardiac death decreased by 70%. Remember, the control arm was doing everything else, not smoking, exercise, taking their diabetes medications, taking their blood pressure medications, and what have you. But the, uh, uh, the, uh, the arm which was being examined uh, had, were, were given a Mediterranean diet to follow. So the incidence of heart attacks and death in the patients who were on the Mediterranean-style diet was decreased by 17%. I mean, that's humongous. That is huge. I mean, nothing I know decreases uh, some, uh, any risk by 70%, not even statins for cholesterol. Nothing I know decreases the risk this much. What about the physician's health study? Uh, this study uh, uh, basically uh, concluded that two to three servings of vegetables per day over 12 years can decrease the risk of heart disease by 20%. They just looked at the, the impact of vegetables over 12 years. Uh, but this one included a little more uh, intense uh, diet, if you may. Yeah? So what's the conclusion? I mean, there should be no doubt, uh, after looking at the, uh, the demographics, after doing a little bit of epidemiological studies going across the earth uh, to Japan, France, looking at ourselves, uh, and the dietary patterns, uh, and remembering what we call the Japanese paradox, there should be no doubt in our mind that food can either prevent heart disease, or guess what? Or provide fuel for a heart attack. There should be absolutely no doubt in the mind uh, that uh, this, is, uh, this is a conclusion which has been uh, drawn from not one, but many, many clinical trials, looking at tens and tens of thousands of patients. <clears throat> so what happens if we uh, don't uh, follow a good diet? It turns out that being overweight translates to a 72% increased risk of blockages over a three-year three, over a three year period. What does overweight mean? I mean, I'm not talking obesity. I'm talking overweight. This is, overweight is defined as a BMI between 25 and 29. Basically, this is, this is me. My BMI is 25 and a half. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, <coughs> Uh, so the standards for overweight uh, are really stringent. Uh, and it turns out that if your BMI is between 25 and 29, uh, then we stand 72% uh, increased risk of blockages in the heart or heart disease over a three-year period. What about obesity? Obesity is defined as BMI more than 30 or 31. The risk is just multiplies, 244% uh, increased risk of blockages in the heart compared to somebody who's not obese. Uh, now, how do we know if you're overweight or obese? Uh, all of us have uh, smartphones, uh, access to the computers. All you need to do is look at your weight, and you need to know your height, and feed it into the computer, and it'll tell you what your BMI is. Uh, if you don't want to do it, have your dog do it for you. The dog's offices, most offices look at weight and height, uh, and they should be able to tell you uh, what your BMI is. Huh? And if they can, then find another doc. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, we kind of hit uh, briefly on uh, the uh, Mediterranean diet. What is Mediterranean diet? Uh, basically, 
uh, eat your veggies and fruits. I'm, I'm going to summarize this uh, because uh, we kind of make it a little uh, easier for you all to remember. Eat your veggies and fruits, go nuts, give a butter, spice it up, and go fish. Good enough? Okay. What about red meat? I mean, uh, you know, I love red meat. And I'm not going to lie to you. We all love red meat. Uh, so how often can we eat? How much can we eat? It turns out that in the lion heart study, uh, red meat was allowed, and uh, remember, when I say red meat, it's not the juicy, fatty portion. It's lean red meat. It was allowed a few times a month. A few times a month. But they were very liberal on fish, and poultry, chicken breast, and turkey breast was okay. Not, not skin, not chicken legs, uh, uh, and the skin was, not, uh, was excluded. Dairy products, uh, skim milk or fat-free milk and low-fat cheese, uh, and another big one is whole grains and legumes. We talked about the lentils, beans, and peas, and all kinds of beans. Uh, so we will talk about how uh, we should put this on a plate and how much uh, each uh, should be in the next few slides. So bear with me. Uh, we, I see a hand raised. Go ahead. Save, save that question for the end. I promise you I'll answer you. Okay. Uh, while we talk about diet, uh, we'll hit upon obesity, we'll hit upon dietary modifications in the end again. Uh, but remember, uh, if you're smoking, uh, I mean, we, we, have, we, we can't forget uh, the common sense rules and regulations here while we uh, try and get a little more involved with diet. I would imagine with so many of us, by the way, I've never seen this many people turn up for a lecture, so this must be an interesting topic. Huh? I hope I'll do justice to it. <coughs> Don't smoke, decrease alcohol intake, and stay active more than 30 minutes a day, and we'll be talking about what kind of exercise, uh, because I'm big on exercise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, uh, well, don't try that at home. <laughs> uh, obesity epidemic. Go ahead, please. On that alcohol, yeah. are you recommending red for wine? Yes. Red wine? Yes. Half a glass to one glass of wine. Uh, the only problem I have is half a glass leads to one, one leads to one and a half, one and a half leads to two. Two and a half leads to three, and I see this all the time. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years, uh, and a lot of my patients have heart attacks, heart disease, balloon stents, open heart, bypass operations, and they ask me about wine, and uh, you, when you become liberal and say, yeah, go ahead and drink a glass of wine, uh, then one becomes two, and before you know it, it's too much. Uh, so my personal recommendation, what do I do? Grape juice. Remember, we talked about the two chemicals, the resveratrol, and flavonoids, uh, it's in wine, it's in grape juice. Uh, they are the ones who give rise to vasodilatation uh, of the blood vessels, decreased uh, inflammation in the uh, blood vessels, uh, decreased uh, LDL, and decreased plaque buildup, or decreased blockage buildup, if you may. Uh, lack of diet, oh, did I see another hand? No, okay. Lack of, uh, lack of diet, what does it give rise to? What does it give rise to? Okay. Why is this important? Because guess what? I know we're not going to like this. We happen to be living in a, uh, in a place which for three years in a row was the fattest city in the entire nation. For three years in a row, McAllen. I mean, we live in Harlingen, but the, uh, they looked at McAllen, the demographics, lifestyle, eating habits are the same uh, in Harlingen as McAllen. Uh, for three years in a row, McAllen was the fattest city in the entire nation. For three years in a row. What's the incident? Uh, I'm not talking overweight. I'm not talking overweight. I'm talking obesity. I mean, there's a huge difference between being overweight and being obese. Big difference. Uh, the incidence of obesity in McAllen is number one in the nation for the last three years in a row. So why, 
Why is obesity important? Uh, especially the abdominal obesity. I mean, you see some, uh, you know, I have some patients who are kind of skinny, skinny arms, skinny shoulders, skinny legs, but then they have a big belly. But then you see other patients who are big everywhere, from top to bottom. So if you had to pick one for yourself, which one would you rather be? The one where you're big from top to bottom or the one where you're skinny everywhere and you have a big tummy? Top to bottom. Thank you. Uh, so the top to bottom is much better than the one where we're skinny everywhere else and we have a big belly. Why? Because the waist, uh, the waist to hip circumference, basically uh, where your hip is, you know, where your waist is big, uh, is linked to a disease called as metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. What is metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance? I mean, th these are the precursors for the king of all diseases. Diabetes. Why do I call diabetes the king of all diseases? Because if we don't control diabetes, if we don't lose weight, we don't keep our blood sugars under control, what does it lead to? Atherosclerosis, or fat buildup in the body. And what's the number one reason why human beings die? I don't care what color you are. Black, yellow, blue, purple, red. It doesn't matter what race you are. What's the number one reason why human beings die? Heart attacks and? Strokes. Actually, heart attacks is number one. Cancer is number two. Uh, but strokes is up there as well. It's, a number, it's, not, it, it's not accidents, it's not AIDS, it's not lung cancer, it's not breast cancer, it's heart attacks. Uh, and for, uh, for the women in this uh, crowd, breast cancer used to be the number one reason why women died, but now it's heart attacks in women as well. And especially uh, uh, dangerous in women because women have notoriously uh, atypical symptoms. Uh, her symptoms can just be dark, I feel tired, I feel fatigued, I feel weak, I can't walk. And guess what? It could be a heart attack. I mean, I don't want to scare you, so if you're feeling weak, God forbid, and we're not having a heart attack right now. We're all doing well in this room. But for those outside this room. So obesity means having too much body fat. It's not the same as being overweight. I mean, you can have Arnold Schwarzenegger in his, in his youth. If you just go by his weight and height, his BMI would be high. Uh, but he was you know, all muscle. Uh, I don't know now because I know he's being beaten up at home. <laughs> but a person may be overweight from extra muscle, bone or water, as well as from having too much fat. So obesity means having too much body fat. And it's easy to do a body fat analysis. Uh, so again, we take the weight and high. We talked about the BMI, 25 to 29 is overweight, 30 and above is obese. The abdominal circumference, 35 inches or 40 for a man. I mean, if there's one number you all want to remember, please remember this, and you can afford to forget everything else in this lecture. Waist circumference, 35 for women, and 40 inches for a man. Why? Because it's the fat on the abdomen which is, which is taking our lives. And the prevalence in Texas is about 30.4%, but McAllen is actually 38%. And we talked about McAllen being named the fattest cities in America. Not one of the fattest cities. This is, a, uh, this is an error. The fattest city in America. This is just a graph <coughs> of the entire country. The ones in the reds are where uh, uh, obesity is uh, higher than the rest of the nation. As you can imagine, as you go back west, uh, the weather gets nicer, Southern California, and I train in Southern California too, so I know it's you know, people beach going and they surf and go uh, skiing on the same day. Uh, I guess a little more health conscious than uh, uh, me and you in Texas. Uh, so uh, the incidence of obesity in these places is much, much higher. Uh, and this is uh, some of the, uh, um, some of the uh, red flags in this nation. McAllen, Edinburgh Mission, number one in the country. Huntington, Little Rock, Mobile, Alabama, Beaumont, Texas. Uh, unfortunately, Texas is there more than, uh, more, more than once. 
This was in December, this was uh, in December uh, 2012. All right, so why is obesity such a problem? I mean, if you, if you uh, look around and see uh, the youth today, I mean, let's divide ourselves into just two hypothetical groups, younger than 45 and older than 70, 75. Who do you think will have more obesity? The younger ones or the uh, not so younger ones? The younger ones. So what have we done to ourselves? I mean, let's go back 20, 30, 40 years in time, okay? Let's go to 1980, and I'll kind of simplify this slide in the interest of time. If you go back 1980, no state had an obesity rate of 15% or more. Zero, I mean, no state. There was not a single state in America in 1980 that had an obesity rate of more than 15%. Not one, zero. Now let me take you down to 2013. Look at this. 41 states have obesity rates of at least 25%. So it's, it's, it's just, just multiplied. I mean, it's a, I mean, translate this uh, into uh, the number of people who are affected. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Imagine how much diabetes it leads to. Imagine how much blockages it leads to. And now we know why uh, the healthcare uh, uh, is, has become such a humongous financial liability for all of us. In Dallas, uh, and we kind of like to make a mockery of this. Uh, in Dallas, uh, they opened up uh, a, a grill, which is in downtown Dallas, and I saw this with my own eyes. It's called the Heart Attack Grill. I swear, it's called the Heart Attack Grill. Go home and Google this, okay? It's called the Heart Attack Grill, and, they, uh, and their claim is they can serve a burger, which is, I don't know, maybe as tall, as big as me, um, but it's about this big. Uh, and it has something like seven and a half thousand calories. And they have the scantily clad women in that, uh, in that restaurant. And the, uh, uh, and the customers who come in are given hospital gowns to wear. And they sit down and they eat uh, these burgers. I swear I'm not, you can go home, look it up on your computer. Heart attack grill, it was on, uh, it was actually on national news. So I happened to be visiting Dallas. Uh, so I drove around and I saw it with my own eyes. And guess what, there was no place in the parking lot. There's no place in the parking lot. I mean, these burgers are humongous. They're affordable, they're cheap. Uh, I guess they must be tasty because they have the fattest, juiciest portion of the meat. So we, uh, so unfortunately, we're making uh, kind of a mockery of uh, the uh, obesity problem, which we as physicians have to deal with uh, day and night. Huh? And we see how much suffering this gives uh, to human beings. So what are the biggest challenges? Uh, obesity, aging, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. Uh, I mean, these are the biggest challenges facing, uh, facing uh, the economy at this time. What do we do uh, about obesity? Uh, you know, we hear about dieting, we hear about uh, weight loss medications, gastric surgeries, and what have you. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of hidden agenda behind marketing diets and gastric surgeries. I mean, just switch on your TV. You'll, you'll hear a ton of advertisements uh, on uh, ready-to-eat uh, meals. Uh, I mean, those are not meals, those are chemicals. I mean, th this is something that we should be cooking at home and not getting in, uh, in the mail. A lot of the uh, diet and weight loss claims, they're expensive, they're not covered by insurance, uh, use of medications with side effects. When I was a fellow uh, in uh, Rush uh, Presbyterian in Chicago, I remember uh, the lawyers in Chicago had hired the fellows and they were giving us like $40 an hour. Why? Because we were supposed to read the ultrasounds and pick up valve diseases uh, in the ultrasounds of the hearts. And the cardiologists were too busy, they didn't want to do this. Uh, and the fellows, uh, I mean, when we train, we don't make much money. We make about $40,000 a year. No health insurance. Uh, so imagine living in downtown Chicago with $40,000 a year. It's hard, to, it's tough to make ends meet. 
So the lawyers would recruit us. Uh, they would recruit, they would come to the schools, the medical schools, and recruit uh, the docs in training and say, hey, we'll give you 100 ultrasounds to read. Uh, we'll give you $5 an ultrasound. Can you read them for us? Uh, and what we were doing, uh, what some of the uh, fellows were doing back then, was reading the ultrasounds on patients who had taken, guess what, weight loss medications. Remember the Fen Fen uh, stories? Uh, the weight loss medication giving rise to mitral valve problems? I mean, these were real patients uh, who were taking weight loss medications and had ruined their heart valves and needed open heart uh, surgeries for something which could have been, been easily done uh, if uh, the rules and regulations we talk about today were followed. Lack of uh, support groups. Uh, yes, you can buy your ready-made dinners on your TV, but waste the support that goes with that. Uh, so basically, to the bottom line, these have become uh, huge uh, businesses. What does work is uh, free and voluntary, non-profit, no medications. Uh, I'm completely against, I have looked at these medications in and out, top and bottom, back and front, uh, and read about their side effects. Weight loss medications come at the price. Uh, be careful uh, if and when you have to take them. Safe and natural methods of weight loss, support and educational opportunities. Uh, you, know, you can join your local groups. Uh, there are some groups in this hospital. Uh, weight Watchers is being one of them. Uh, I don't mean to endorse anyone. I don't work for them. Uh, but it's a nominal fee. Your local church groups uh, get together and we'll talk about how to combat the incidence of obesity. Uh, I don't see anyone who is obese in this crowd, but share the secrets that you'll learn today. Yeah? So the method uh, of uh, weight loss is make a small dietary change in your lifestyle every single month and add a physical activity to your lifestyle every month. Example, walking for a few minutes. And uh, you know, luckily we live in 21st century. Uh, if it's hard for you to find a place where there's an educational or motivational speaker, go on YouTube, go, on, go online. You can hear a ton of lectures on how to combat obesity and how to uh, kind of uh, stay, uh, 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 stay with uh, your weight loss uh, program. All right, uh, we talked about calories because you'll see these numbers uh, thrown around on, in any diet lecture. So what is a calorie? It turns out that a calorie is energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water to one degree Celsius by one degree Celsius. So one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So that's what one calorie is. What are the calorie needs? How many, do, how many calories uh, do we need uh, just to survive? I mean, let's make the assumption we're just sitting in one place, not moving, not doing, not, not doing anything for 24 hours. How many calories do we need in those 24 hours? The magic number is 1250. This is because we still have to breathe. Our heart still has to beat. We are still making, the kidneys still have to make urine. Our brain is still thinking, we are looking. So we're using uh, energy uh, even when we're sitting and doing nothing. So we need about 1250 calories a day. Remember that number because that's kind of where the uh, calorie uh, recommendations will come from. Food categories, uh, what is food made up of? It's made up of carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. One gram of carbohydrate and one gram of protein gives four calories, and one gram of fat gives nine calories. Throw this equation around. Remember how students in elementary school do? If uh, two equals two, and you bring the two on the right to the left, then it's still two equals two. Okay. Why is that important here? Because if you put nine calories here and one gram here, Imagine if we eat nine calories of fat in one day, what do we gain? We gain one gram of fat. I had done a little experiment with a small Sprite soda can, a small Sprite can. The amount of calories it has. If we take one can of Sprite, and this is a small can, not, I'm not talking bottles of, can, uh, of Sprite. A small can of Sprite every single day for the next 12 months. Yes, and did nothing else, and didn't change your life, just all we did was one extra Sprite uh, every single day. We would put on close to 12 pounds of fat in the 12 months. If we did nothing else but just took one can of Sprite a day, every single day for the next 12 months, we'll put on between 11 and 12 pounds uh, a year from now. 
Now let's go back. If we are in the habit of taking soda every single day, just doing nothing but giving up soda, every single day we will lose that much weight in the next 12 months. Well, I don't mean to pick on Sprite, but uh, all, uh, you know, Pepsi, Coke, what have you. So the concept of balanced diet. <clears throat> concept of balanced diet is what is needed, uh, A, to stay healthy, and B, uh, if we are overweight or obese, uh, to lose the excess weight. So how much weight should we lose uh, in a week uh, to maintain uh, realistic goals? Uh, I mean, the, uh, the weight loss clinics, if they say you can lose 20 pounds in 10 days, don't waste your time. It's not going to work. And even if it does, you'll gain it right back. What does work is a gradual change in lifestyle uh, and maintaining that lifestyle. So the, the recommendation by weight loss uh, societies is about one to two pounds a week, which translates to about 500 to 1,000 kilocalories a day of negative energy. Diet alone would be very difficult, very difficult. So you kind of have to complement diet with exercise. And with that note, uh, we will soon talk about the exercise as well. So the goal again should be about one to two pounds per week and this can be achieved by a diet which is lesser than about 500 to 1,000 calories than what we are doing now, by doing about 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity on most days of the week. Behavior modification, this is extremely important. I, have, I can't tell you how many patients I have. I say, Doc, I live by myself. I, I don't have relatives, don't have friends, I'm just watching TV and I'm eating. So depression. Depression is just a humongous problem. We all suffer from some form of depression at some stage in our lives. Nobody escapes. Uh, so what does the human body do uh, when we are depressed? One way uh, my psychiatrist colleagues will, uh, will tell us that one way we like to compensate is by overeating. Uh, so behavior modification is uh, important. I can't stress enough on group support and kind of educating ourselves. We, our intention is not to become dietitians. Our intention is, hey, well, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What can we do uh, to improve? And just some, to, uh, and arming ourselves with the basic knowledge. We talked about uh, the Mediterranean diets. Uh, we talked about uh, the Lion Health Study. We talked about uh, the Physician's Health Study. We talked about what American Heart Association recommends. And uh, there is a common theme in all of those recommendations, and that is to stay away from simple carbohydrates and to incorporate more omega-3 fatty acids. This is what we can do to decrease incidence of heart disease uh, in this country and elsewhere as well. We need a few uh, basic tools. We need to have a measuring tape, a weighing scale, a calculator, a notebook, or a, or a calorie counter app on smartphones. How many of us have smartphones? Most of us have smartphones, and if, you, if we don't, then all we need is a notebook, and write down in the notebook before you sleep every single thing that you have eaten that day. What this does, I mean, this has been shown again and again in trials, what this does is it, it makes us a little more conscious of what we have eaten. When the hand writes down on a piece of paper, we kind of hold ourselves accountable uh, so this is uh, of tremendous importance that we kind of start logging what we do every single day and hold ourselves accountable at the end of the day or the end of the week. And then daily charting, weekly analysis, calorie needs calculation, most obese individuals about 14 to 1600 calories per day is good enough. Now you may say, Doc, I'm Michael Phelps, I swim 10 miles every single day. Then yes, obviously your calorie requirement is going to be different. But for the rest of us who are not Michael Phelps, our calorie needs in a day, if we would like to maintain or lose weight, should be between 1,400 and 1,700 calories. And I think we have samples of 1,500 calorie diets outside. Please feel free to take one of those. Uh, and if you're out of them, uh, we can always give them to you again. Uh, make copies of those and give it to your friends, neighbors, relatives. 
enemies. <laughs> All right, we talked about carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Uh, how do we divide this? I mean, we, we don't have time to weigh. What do we do? We, uh, how do we divide this on the plate? If you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, dietitians, they will give you uh, diagrams on how a plate should be divided. But if you would like to just remember some basic facts, about half the plate should be vegetables and fruits, one-fourth should be protein, and one-fourth should be whole grains. So right here, you'll kind of get all the carbs, proteins, and the healthy fats uh, that, you, that we need to. When we talk about protein, try to stick to seafood or poultry. One of the things which, you know, uh, the downside of living in 21st century, I guess, is we are polluting the oceans. And uh, there was a picture which kind of stuck to my mind where uh, there was just a huge, huge uh, plastic cans and bottles floating in the ocean. Uh, it looked like a hundred ships floating together from, uh, f from the air. So uh, the mercury poisoning is something which we have to be careful with uh, in seafood. Uh, what uh, the food and drug, uh, the FDA recommends is to eat seafood about two or three times a week. Uh, and, uh, and to stay away from fish that is high in, uh, in mercury, for example, tuna. So salmon is a good source. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of our fish have been contaminated. One good rule of thumb to uh, remember, if you don't like to remember all the names of the fish, is uh, the bigger and the older the fish is, the higher the mercury content. Sardines, for example, very low in mercury content. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, the take-home point is still please incorporate seafood, fish uh, in your diet two or three times a week. And the rest of the time, poultry, well, the chicken breast, he's waving his hand, so I have, kind of have to speed up, bear with me. Uh, rest of the time, chicken breast, turkey breast, lean uh, meat, stick with lean meat. Have your butcher uh, take off, uh, shred off as much fat as you can and stick with lean meat a few times a month. Sorry, I love my burgers, but this is what you have to do. Huh? And learn how to read food labels. I had uh, an entire lecture on how to read food labels and how, and how food labels can be misleading. Uh, but get into the habit, almost anything you buy uh, will have the fat, protein, and carbohydrate content in, uh, in the back. So j write it down, and at the end of the day, uh, add up and see how much of each you have taken and stick to the uh, uh, 15 to 1700 calories. If you're a female, about 14 to 1500 a day. For males, about 16 to 1700 a day. Doctor? Uh, yes. On the news today, tonight, uh, there was a blip about the government trying to change the label insisting that the labels on all food be changed to read what you eat, not a portion that they say is two-thirds, that two-thirds equals X amount of calories, when we know that we're going to eat a cup, not two-thirds. So they want the labels to read what the public eats, the calories, the sodium, the only problem being that the sodium is going to be increased tenfold yes. according to what we eat. No, thank but, uh, this, is, this was on tonight's news. Yes, thank you. I, I actually saw that as well. Uh, Bloomberg uh, tried doing something politically incorrect, if you may, which is uh, making large soda cans illegal in, uh, in New York City. Uh, I think these, uh, and my last slide is uh, what we can do at a political level. Actually, my last but one slide, if I have time, and if he doesn't chase me out of this room. Uh, but going back, uh, half the plate should be vegetables and fruits, about one fourth should be greens, another one fourth should be protein. What, grain, uh, what kind of greens are we talking about? Wheat bread, not white bread. Green cereal, whole grain rice like brown rice, beans. I can't tell you, uh, and white rice is poisonous. White rice is nothing but sugar. The layer uh, on, the, uh, on the rice has just been removed, and the inner carbohydrate core is what is white rice. The protein shell has basically been taken off. Uh, brown rice has a much lower glycemic index, meaning it is gradually digested. You don't bombard your pancreas gland saying, hey, I've taken a zillion grams of sugar, we digest. 
So you go real slow with, the bro uh, with uh, complex carbohydrates. Vegetables, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, celery, eggplant, lettuce, spinach, tomato, fruits, apples, berries, grapefruit, dry oranges, pineapple. Be careful with excessive fruit consumption. Watermelons, for example, very high glycemic index. If the fruit tastes really, really yummy, and if it's juicy, then the uh, sugar content in that is uh, probably high. Uh, protein, we talked about what, what are the healthy proteins. We talked about dairy. The calorie count, this is something we have to do. I mean, I don't care if we, if we have perfect bodies. We still need to kind of get, get into the habit of counting how many calories we've taken in a day. Hold, we need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to write down at the end of the day how many calories we have taken. Uh, because this is the only scientific way we can analyze if we're doing something right or if we're doing something wrong. So write down everything you put in your mouth. I don't care if it's a glass of water, but write it down. Do it for a few weeks. Because you, but once we change our lifestyle and once we kind of get into the uh, habit of uh, eating healthy, we don't have to do this anymore. This is just to develop uh, good habits. And, and trials have shown this. If we did nothing else but just writing down what we eat at the end of the day, we become more health conscious. Exercise, I think I'm going to the, the importance of exercise. I mean, I, can't, I cannot stress on this enough. We did, uh, I, I did a, a six months uh, in a heart transplant program in Rush Presbyterian Chicago. I mean, these are patients who were, who were on the list for heart transplants. I know it kind of sounds bad, but we were hoping and wishing and praying that they would have a young heart. Uh, and the way we would get this young heart uh, was somebody dying from automobile accidents. Uh, that was the biggest uh, resource we had back then. But even patients who were on the heart transplant list were given exercise prescriptions. Even patients whose heart function was 10% were given exercise prescriptions. So I can't stress how important exercise is. It's not possible to combat obesity. It's not possible to, uh, it's not possible to uh, take care of uh, uh, maintaining a healthy body weight just by having uh, dietary restrictions alone. It has to be complemented with exercise. And at the same time, you can't just exercise and eat anything under the sun and expect to maintain an ideal body weight or even lose weight. So just uh, the, uh, the reason why exercise is, is important, just anticipating exercise decreases parasympathetic tone, increases heart rate, increases uh, breathing, increases venous return, and uh, all of these burns calories. I mean, just, this is just, imagine you're getting on a bike. You haven't gotten on a bike, you haven't moved an inch. Just thinking about it makes your body uh, undergo uh, these changes and you're burning calories even before you get on the bike. So, uh, what, how much exercise uh, is recommended? The American uh, uh, College of Sports Medicine, the ACSM, recommendation is the most widely quoted one. They say about 30 minutes of moderate intensity per day for weight loss amount is more. To maintain a healthy body weight, about half an hour of walking at four miles an hour. But if you have to lose weight, then that recommendation is four to five minutes. We spend about 225 calories by cleaning our homes, about 360 calories biking at 10 miles an hour for one hour. Moderate walking, we burn about 360 calories per hour. Weight lifting, about 540 calories per hour. So we, if you walk at a moderate pace, for one hour, you'll burn 360 calories. But if you were to down a hamburger from McDonald's, how long would it take? 10 minutes? 10 minutes, at the most. I mean, if you, you can go slow, maybe enjoy it for the next 15 minutes. Uh, but you're downing anywhere between two to two and a half times this much.
when you think of an exercise prescription, the type of exercise is important. If we are overweight or obese, try and do something which doesn't stress your joints, like biking instead of running on a treadmill. The duration is important, frequency, intensity, and remember these three, if you, we have to increase our exercise in, in, in this uh, order. If you're walking for five minutes a day, make it 10 minutes a day after one week. Make it 20 minutes, reach the goal of 30 to 45 minutes, and then instead of, if you're doing it three times a day, make it four, five, six times a week. You need one day a week off. And then last is what the intensity. The, instead of walking at a brisk pace, now you can walk faster. So work in that order. Uh, but it is safe to conclude that exercise is very effective in prevention of obesity. But if we are already obese, if our BMI is already more than 30, then exercise alone is not going to do it. Why? Because you need to have a deficit of about 500 to 1,000 calories every single day to lose about half, about one pound a week, approximately. Now remember, I just showed you how many calories we burn. It's not easy to burn a thousand calories a day by doing exercise alone. I mean, how many of us can swim like Michael Phelps? <laughs> Probably none of us. Yeah. How many of us can run for an hour? Probably none of us. So exercise alone, it's very difficult. So you ha we have to complement exercise and diet. Somebody raised uh, uh, the political awareness. Um, uh, the, uh, the current healthcare management of obese patients is impaired by lack of time, poor reimbursement, negative attitudes, lack of understanding of the magnitude of the nature of the disease, and prevention programs should consider important aspects of lifestyle change that encompass nutrition and exercise. If you pick up a textbook of cardiology, just from, I'm not talking 10 years ago, I'm talking 20 years ago. Uh, there's one by name, Brown Wall's textbook of cardiology, it's kind of like the Bible of cardiology, if you may. It's, uh, it's about this big, has thousands and thousands of pages. Do you know the section on obesity, how big it is? Half a page. I mean, it is just disgusting. I mean, this is just from 20 years ago. I mean, these are cardiologists who are being trained. And all they have in the Bible of the textbook of cardiology is half a page on obesity. Absolutely nothing else. Uh, medical schools are becoming more and more conscious about this. Uh, at a political level, uh, people are becoming more conscious. Why? Because if we don't, forget uh, change in weather, forget terrorism, forget whatever else. Obesity is going to just bankrupt us. And the current physician practice patterns, lack of time, limited staff support, limited financial resources. Uh, you have a doc seeing 40, 50 patients a day. Uh, how can a doc do justice to his patients and uh, inform him or teach him what a cal or, or a patient what a calorie is? How to maintain an ideal body weight? How much exercise time is needed? It's, uh, it's, it, it's very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, a lot of negative attitudes, and we have to change this. Uh, I had one uh, patient who was 450 pounds. And it was like the whole entire society, her own family, her friends, her relatives, neighbors, everybody had turned their backs on her. And what did she do? I mean, this lady had nothing, no, no, no one to talk to. So it was a vicious cycle. She would just eat and eat and eat and eat. Uh, so, and in the end, she underwent a gastric uh, operation. She lost about 150, 175 pounds and she was able to get out of her bedroom and socialize and kind of get back into the rhythm of humor. My last slide, uh, I mean, I made this because I gave a lecture on uh, diet just before Christmas. But then I realized uh, that, hey, this is something which is good even at other times. You know, focus on people, not the food, distraction eating, uh, this is huge. When we eat, sit down on a dinner table, not in front of the TV. Uh, if you overeat for one meal, eat light on the next meal. Well, preferably don't overeat for any meal. Eat healthy snacks before going to a party, like a protein-rich food, salads, etc. Never go hungry before a party because that's when you tend to eat more. Drink large glasses of water daily. Choose wisely from the foods on the table. We talked about smoked salmon, fruit, salads, vegetables. 
using small plates. I mean, I know it kind of sounds silly, uh, but believe it or not, it, it has been shown in clinical trials. Just uh, using smaller plates will help, kind of like what the French do. Uh, they use small plates, but they also, uh, the food on a small plate is in one corner of the plate, and most of the plate is empty. Uh, eat uh, slowly, uh, enjoy your food, drink responsibly, no soda, be active and stay healthy. We talked about uh, how much uh, exercise uh, one should do. Uh, and if you're meeting your goals, uh, you know, reward yourself. I mean, a lot of people talk about cheat days. It's like one day a month, hey, can we eat anything under the sun? Be careful how much you cheat because once you have a cheat day, then you kind of have to spend another week or two uh, to uh, gain back uh, what you've lost. Uh, eat small portions of your favorite foods. Wear, uh, I know uh, this may not be possible, but wearing a tight belt or a waistband uh, can physically decrease, uh, can exert pressure on your, on your stomach, and it will prevent us from overeating. Be realistic and don't try to lose uh, too much weight. Uh, try and lose about one pound a month, uh, one, excuse me, half a pound to one pound a week should be plenty. Uh, don't give yourselves goals of, ah, I'm gonna join a gym, I'll go on a diet, hey, watch me doc, in the, next ten, in the next two months I'll lose 20 pounds. Plan times for exercise, don't skip meals, because if you skip meals, uh, your body will rebel. Uh, you'll come back in the next meal and eat, eat up more than twice what you would have. Eat until you're satisfied, not stuffed. Uh, a good time to quit uh, eating is when you feel like you still need to go for a second serving. Stop, we don't need to. I mean, the uh, incidence of obesity uh, in Texas is about 30.4%. In McAllen and South Texas is about 38%. Incidence of obesity, I'm not talking overweight. I mean, if you throw in overweight, it's between 50 to 60%. Bring your own healthy dish to a holiday party or gathering. This may not be always possible. If you have leftovers, a common reason I hear, Doc, I went to the restaurant, didn't want to leave food on the plate, felt, felt guilty. You, you see there's pictures of people starving the rest of the world. Uh, so I ate it up. No, you can always pack it and take it home, eat it in the, the following day. Uh, so again, just to summarize, uh, we talked about uh, uh, diet, we talked about uh, how to uh, uh, combat uh, obesity, we talked about the, the political, the social, the economic uh, impact uh, of obesity. Actually, we didn't talk about the economic impact, uh, but it's safe to say that obesity is on its way uh, to financially bankrupt us. Uh, it's going to happen in the next uh, few decades if we don't combat obesity now. Uh, and then we talked about how exercise is important. We talked about uh, the calorie. We talked about the different food categories. Uh, and I think uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll stop here. I uh, know I realize I had to flip through a lot of the slides. It's a ton of information which I'm trying to pack into four or five minutes. Uh, if I have succeeded, Thank you. If I have not, we can always try this another time. Thank you.